the name of Jesus. We just ask you, Holy Spirit, to touch us. We ask you to renew us and refresh us in the Holy Spirit. Even now, in Jesus' name, amen. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. I'm caught up in the fellowship. Jesus, your love is so amazing. And this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. Catch us up in your fellowship. Holy Spirit, Father, Son. We want to be caught up in the conversation. We want to be caught up in the conversation. Your heart's so full, you can't contain it. Waves are crashing over me, and I feel so safe, I can't explain it. Peace and joy abound in me, the love, the inside of you is so pure so right it fills all heaven with its light the love inside of you is so pure so right it fills all heaven with its light though angels dance and sing before you with saints of old around your throne and my eyes are fixed as i adore you my heart is set on you caught up in the fellowship Jesus your love is so amazing and this joy can't explain it I'm caught up in the fellowship yes I'm caught up in the fellowship Jesus your love is so amazing and this joy can't explain it I'm caught up in the fellowship it's some caught up in the fellowship, Jesus, your love is so amazing, and this joy can't explain it, 
I'm caught up in the fellowship oh, You're the one, there you go again Lifting my heart, lifting my head Hope is rising as I see you smiling You're the one, you're the one, there you go again Lifting my heart, lifting my head Caught up in the fellowship, Jesus, your love is so amazing, and this joy can't explain it. I'm caught up in the fellowship. The love inside of you is so pure, so right, it fills all heaven with its light. The love inside of you is so pure, so right, it fills our heaven with its light. All things have passed away, your love has stayed the same. Your constant grace remains the cornerstone. Things that we thought were dead are breathing in life again. You cause your son to Shine and darkest night See, all things have passed away All things have passed away Your love has stayed the same Your constant grace remains the cornerstone Things that we thought were dead Breathing in life again You cause your sun to shine in darkest night For all that you've done
Remind me again that I can delight in your shade. I delight in your shade. Conversation of love. ourselves before you God but with your blood the sacrifice of love given by the Father through the Son for us we come I'll never leave you I'll never turn my heart away you are my only love darkness where fear and doubt seem truer I'll never turn away I'll never leave you I'll never leave you I'll never turn my heart away you are my only love and in the darkness where fear and doubt seem truer, I'll never turn away. Oh, help me, God, to love you. Help me, God, to love you. Take these weak and broken vows. Come before 
for you, Lord. Dances in your mercy. You are the one able to keep me to the end. And even when my heart condemns me, your love, your love is greater than my weakness. My confidence. Is your mercy? You are the one able to keep me to and even when my heart condemns me. Your love is greater than my.
God to love you. Take these weak and broken vows and make me yours. Make me yours. As Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for pouring out your life and setting the example of how to love one another and love the Father. We ask that you would come and release revelation to our hearts by your Holy Spirit tonight. Let us peer into the conversation. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, worship team. Let's take a moment just to greet the folks around you. Just take a minute. Just reach your hand out. Hello, my name is. If you don't have the teaching notes and you want them, raise your hand up. Just wave your hand real hot, fat. I mean, clearly. Good, everyone's got them, good. Okay, let's go ahead and grab a seat. And jump right in there. Father, we open our heart to you, Father of glory. We ask you, Father of glory, for a revelation and an impartation of your glory. Lord, as we bring our weak frame, our weak mind and heart and understanding, and we say that we know it takes God to reveal God and to love God. So God, the Holy Spirit, we were created for you. We ask you, inspire us escort us into the deeper things of the Father and the Son's heart. We ask you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Well, we're looking at session two. I've said this a couple times, but just kind of get your mind around it, is that the plan is to do five 12-part series. So it would be 60 messages in the next year in plus plus a year and a few months. So five times, 12 different messages, and we're gonna cover this first series, just main themes and some foundational understanding. And then we're gonna look at it verse by verse for the next four 12-week sessions. <clears throat> now some of you uh, <clears throat> got the announcement I just determined earlier this week is, I'm actually going to put off the sea bats starting our cycle two. Well, I was planning to start in August. I'm very excited about the three-year cycle of sea bats, the 150 chapters. We've done all 150 chapters, 90 weeks. We've done it over a three-year period, took the summers off, about to start cycle two. I just felt so stirred by the Lord that I want to be undistracted in my focus of giving myself to really search this out for the next year, I mean, beyond a year. And so I'm just locking in and limiting myself to mostly just doing these Friday night services and spending the rest of the, rest of the week in the prayer room and different responsibilities I have, but really staying focused on John 13 to 17. So I find that I, I, I uh, understand this, these five chapters as the final frontier of the Holy Spirit for the end time church. Not that I don't know how deep we will go, but I believe this is the final frontier. There's nothing deeper than this. And as I've spent the last many months really searching this out even more, I've, I've studied it for years, but never in a completely locked in focused way, like I did the 150 chapters, but I'm doing it over the last maybe six months in a real focused way. And it's just becoming more and more clear that this thing is deeper and deeper and deeper than I thought it was. Obviously it is. 
It's Jesus' greatest teaching, the greatest teaching of the greatest teacher in human history. And so we can be sure that every phrase has more than meets the eye. And the reason I'm saying that is I want you to be patient with yourself. The body of Christ, over, myself included, we're so unfamiliar with these concepts. I mean, we, we've read them. We're a little bit familiar but, but we haven't camped out on these, in these passages and these verses line by line in a sustained time, a period of time for, for years. So be patient with yourself. We'll just move forward. But I just believe in this next 14 to 15 months that I'm going to look back over this period of time and be very grateful, just I laid everything else aside, just to really lock in and just commit myself to these just Friday nights, uh, the 730 services, just to give myself to it. And I'm trusting that you will lay aside some things and go deeper in this. And, and a number of you won't be here a year from now. Some of you will, some of you won't be. But stay with this. I'm talking about for, for the next, I mean for the rest of your life. But really lock in the next couple of years and determine you're going to go deep on this. Well, we're at session two in our first series. And this is the glory of God that's expressed in Trinitarian love. And again, I believe John 13 to 17 is the final frontier of the Holy Spirit for the end time church. And I, again, I look at this vast mountain and I say, Lord, he goes, I'll take you further in this if you want to go. And I'm saying, yes, I want to go. And I know that many of you are saying the same or you wouldn't be here tonight. Paragraph A, the reality of the Trinity <clears throat> One of the most important doctrines, but it's more than a set of doctrinal truths. It's a reality. It's one of the most important biblical truths set forth in the Scriptures. There's over 70 passages in the New Testament that reference God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in deep relationship together. In one way or the other, they make reference to it. So it's not a peripheral or secondary subject. And it's not a subject we want to leave to scholars to debate over, you know, Hebrew and Greek words and historical arguments, but it's, it's a reality to encounter and to enter into, not just to stand at a distance and kind of muse over the different historical arguments and debates. Today, the doctrine or the reality of the Trinity is under attack, even in the body of Christ. And the reason it's under attack is because many people, even with a Christian heritage and a Christian confession, they're in this trajectory to want to blend all the religions of the world into one faith. But the problem is it's impossible to have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as God. It doesn't blend to any of the other world religions. It stands unique and distinct. And therefore, more and more, even within the Christian confession or wanting to dismiss this reality so they can fit it into the uh, larger, you know, uh, conversation of world religions that we're just all seeking the same God going in the same direction no matter what our faith, which is a total uh, a heresy and it's a, a, a very, very serious deception. So we want to take time to understand this with our mind. Now, we're not going to get that far with our mind, but we can get a lot further than we are today. I mean, this is a deep, deep ocean or a high, high mountain, but there's a lot of ground we can gain before we've reached the limits of what we'll understand in this age. So we want to take time to understand the Trinity. And that's core to John 13 to 17, is the Trinitarian interaction and conversation with one another. Well, we want to be equipped to defend the Trinity and the onslaught of you know, uh, uh, religious debates trying to dumb down Christianity to make it the same as all the world religions. But not just we wanted to be able to defend it for that reason. We want to understand some of it, more of it, so we can enter into the Trinitarian conversation. I mean, the more we understand, the more we'll engage in it. Paragraph B, the doctrine of the Trinity teaches that God exists as three persons. Obviously, most of you are very aware of that, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Each distinct person, each of them are fully God, and they are eternally God. 
So therefore, the scripture says there's one God in three persons. The mystery of the Trinity. Three persons dwelling together in such deep relationship that they live together as one God. Now again, that boggles the mind and our understanding, and there's quite a few analogies. You know, it's like one famous analogy is, you know, H2O. It can be ice, it can be solid, it can be liquid, or it can be a vapor, but it's one, but it's distinct, but it's the same, but it's not exactly the same. There's a number of analogies like that. We're not going to look at all of them right now, but just as you're launching out in your journey to understand this a little bit more with your mind, just know that there's much information out there, and I, I love it. I, I've got so much, even on my, my laptop, documents. I mean, hundreds of, of documents, you know, my different ones helping me in research have assembled over the years, and it's just fascinating. Some of it's not that helpful, but some of it is just, I don't get it. Others of it, is, it's fascinating, and it really sparks my spiritual hunger to go deeper. Paragraph C. I said this last week, and I'll probably reference this a number of times in this 60-session series over the next 14 months. 60 sessions on John 13 to 17. Lord willing, of course, but I think he is. Review the five parts of the intimacy process. And these five parts, they overlap. We can't fully distinguish them when, I mean, separate them. They do overlap together. But this intimacy process begins with no understanding in our mind. Don't minimize that. It's not limited to that, but understanding it intellectually a little bit is important. We, the five parts, first we get it in our mind. And again, we're only going to go so far of understanding this but we can go a lot further than we are right now. Once we understand, have knowledge, I mean, talk about mental knowledge, like, oh, Father is in the Son, the Son's in the Father, and that means these four or five things, at least. It means more, but at least means that. The next stage is, once we get this information, then we enter into conversation with the Lord related to it. And the conversation, <clears throat> the, the way I'm gonna say this many, many times, I've done it for years, is, when I see a truth about God, even how God relates to God or how God relates to me or to you, I like to say, thank you, Lord, show me more. And as simple as that is, I look back over some decades and simply stopping and pausing. When I'm reading the scripture, talking about the Father loves the Son. Thank you, Father, show me more. Something happens when I start the conversation. Sometimes I'm done with it in 10 seconds. Sometimes <clears throat> two or three minutes. Sometimes it really takes off in another direction. But don't just underline the passage and go, wow, amazing. Talk to God for a moment. Take the knowledge and turn it into conversation, even ever so briefly. Then after the conversation, here and there, not always, there's sparks of illumination, meaning, oh, I get it. Oh, I see it more clearly. You get illumination or call it revelation or call it greater understanding. I just want all the words to kind of rhyme together. Understanding doesn't fit, you know, it doesn't end with T-I-O-N. But anyway, but it means living understanding is what we're talking about. Sparks of insight come. As we're in the conversation, much more will happen if you stop and turn the truth into a conversation. And then after the illumination or the, or the living understanding, it inspires us. Then it gives us zeal, motivation, ah. Uh -uh. I'm not backing down. I want to go for all of this. The more living understanding or illumination we receive, the greater zeal and determination. We're going to go deeper and deeper, and no one's going to deter us. Nothing is going to deter us. Of course, that leads to transformation of our mind and our emotions and our choices. But stop when you read the information. But my point tonight is we're going to take time to learn some of the information, even though it... It's a little, it's a bit unfamiliar. Some of it's cryptic. It's like, okay, but we're going to turn it into conversation. That's the point. That's the takeaway. Thank you, Lord. Show me more. We just use the, that beginning phrase at a hundred truths, a thousand truths. Paragraph D. <clears throat> the word Trinity is not actually in the Bible. Just like the word rapture is not actually in the Bible. The, the concepts are in the Bible. The, the truth is clearly set forth in the Bible. 
Trinity means triunity or three in one. Most of you are aware of that. Paragraph E, <clears throat> just to give you a little history lesson. And don't be afraid of paragraph E. Like say, oh no, those are two names. That's history. You know, shut down. Don't shut down. The, you can learn these two names. And one of them you already know. You know Augustine. Athanasius. Athanasius is a, there are only two names. Two good guys and one bad guy. The reason I want you, and I'll tell you the, the Arius is the bad guy. We don't get to him to paragraph G. But Athanasius was the first man in church history, got a little bit there, the, who established, brought together the truths of the deity of Jesus, the deity of the Father, the deity of the Spirit, and put them all together and says, wait a second, it's one God and three persons. He's the one that spent his entire life, was persecuted fiercely for it. He wrote much on it. And so you just want to know his name because when you read different articles or a little bit of research on it, you'll run into his name over and over again. You know, in the, uh, the analogy of American history, it'd be George Washington. It's okay to learn the name George Washington. It's going to be important if you're going to know American history. Athanasius is that prominent in the, in the clarifying, as much as it has been clarified in the human arena, the doctrine and the reality of the Trinity. And then Augustine came a few years. He was about, uh, Augustine was a, uh, about 20 years old when Athanasius died. So they overlapped for just a minute. Augustine taught more on the Trinity than any man in history, any person in history. So, so the, the uh, Athanasian Creed, paragraph F, is the clearest statement. There's a number of uh, creeds, meaning in the early church, all the bishops got together. There's the Nic Nicene Creed. There's the Apostles' Creed. And each of these creeds formalized the church, the truths in, in the early church that was coming together. Because remember, Jesus died and they hadn't written the New Testament yet. So it took them a while to get the Gospels out and then the Epistles, then they put them all together. Then they made these creeds. And the Athanasian Creed teaches, in essence, each person of the Godhead, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, <clears throat> each of them are uncreated. There was never a time where the Son did not exist. Each of them are infinite or limitless. Each of them are eternal. Each of them are almighty or possess total divine power. All three persons are co-equal and they're eternal. That's the, the general gist of it. Paragraph G, Arius, he was the guy that, that uh, uh, argued. He's the guy that stood against Athanasius and, and pushed back against him. And he said, wait a second. Jesus is the greatest man that ever lived, the greatest prophet, but he wasn't God. Jesus was created by God. He was only a man, a very great man. And that really sounds exciting but it, it undermines how Jesus presented himself and taught himself. I mean, and, and presented himself and how it's taught in the scripture. Jesus is far more than a great man. He's the uncreated God like the Father and like the Spirit. I like uh, how uh, C.S. Lewis presented it. I remember my college years in the 70s. We, we were all into this. That the uh, C.S. Lewis, he said, Jesus is either... Lord, lunatic, or liar. He can only be one of those three. And, and C.S. Lewis put it together so precisely. He goes, he's either the Lord, he said the truth about who he is, or he's a lunatic. He really believed he was God, but he never, he never was. He was completely crazy. Or he was a bold-faced liar. He knew he wasn't God, but said he was. He goes, those are the only three options. Either he is the Lord or he's a lunatic who was out of his mind by the things he said or he was a bold-faced uh, bold liar. And of course, we believe he, was, he, he is Lord. So the Athanasius, he stood against it and he uh, was condemned as a heretic. But the religions, the arguments today is to make Jesus a great prophet. Islam has Jesus as a great prophet, but not God. And more and more religions are willing to give that status to Jesus, but it's heresy. I have a, a paragraph H. I'm not going to read it, but A.W. Tozer, who is one of the deep, uh, deeper 
deeper life in God teachers of this last uh, generation. He's, he said some really, I mean, some inspiring things. I'll leave that to you to, under, to uh, read on your own. Uh, Augustine, who wrote the most on the Trinity than anybody in, in church history, he has a couple well-known things that are attributed to him. One of the things that he said is that, he says, if you try to ex, uh, fully understand and explain the Trinity, you'll lose your mind. But if you deny the Trinity, you'll lose your soul. <laughs> because to deny the Trinity means Jesus isn't God, means Jesus is a liar and a deceiver, means he didn't really do what he said he did. He says, if you try to fully explain it, you'll lose your mind. If you deny it, you'll lose your soul. That's a, a kind of a famous I mean, I'm not quoting it 100% exactly accurate, but that's the essence of what he said. The other famous story I want to point out about Augustine is that the famous story of when he was walking by the uh, seashore and, and he was about to write his great work on the Trinity. And he was, and there's several different ways this story is told, but he was thinking, Lord, I want to, I want to uh, really unpack what the scripture says about you and serve you well and explain you. And then the Lord uh, speaks to his heart and says, pick up the seashell. And he picks up a seashell. He says, now go empty the ocean with that seashell. And he says, I can't empty the ocean with this sea seashell. And the Lord says, neither can the small, finite shell of your mind understand the ocean of my being. You will never empty the full mysteries of who I am uh, three persons as one God in the fullness of the mystery of the Trinity, not in this age. Anselm was a, the Archbishop of Canterbury in the uh, 11th century, and he, this very famous, I love this, he was a very devout uh, uh, man of God and, and really loved the truth about the Trinity and spent met much of his life searching it out, studying the writings of Augustine and and Athanasius, and, and he wrote this. It's been quoted by many people. He said, Lord, let me seek thee in longing. In other words, I have this aching desire that can't be satisfied. I have to say, I have to have more. I'm gonna seek you with an aching longing. I gotta get more. But let me find thee in love. As you reveal love, the essence of your love, I will find more of you through the prison prism or the lens of the revelation of love. But in the process of it all, let me love you in discovering you little by little, the process of finding you. Let me seek thee in longing. Let me find thee in love and let me love thee in the process of finding you. Top of page two. <clears throat> There's indications of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Again, this is a real brief snapshot, and I, I'm really wanting to excite your uh, interest. Some of you are already there. You've been there for a while. But some of you are thinking, Trinity, I just thought that was, you know, nobody gets it anyway, so what's the big deal? No, we want to go after this. We want to understand it a little bit. Again, we'll never get to the, to, to the top of that mountain or the bottom of that ocean, whichever analogy you use, but there's a lot more understanding we can get than what we have today. And once we get the knowledge, then it turns into conversation, turn conversation, into living understanding, et cetera, et cetera. So indications of the Trinity in the Old Testament. Paragraph A. The very first time God spoke in the Bible, the very first time he spoke, he used the plural. Let us make man in our image. So it's, the Trinity is declared from the very first declaration that the Lord ever made in the Scripture. Paragraph B, there's several places, I have a, several of them mentioned here, where God speaks to God. So God, one person of the Godhead, the Godhead is the three persons together, the Trinity. One person of the Godhead speaks to the other, and I have a few examples there. <clears throat> Paragraph C, Jesus asked the Pharisees four questions. Here in Matthew chapter 22, question number one, he goes, what do you think? That's question one. What do you think about the Messiah? The Christ means the Messiah. You guys are scholars. You know the Bible. What's your paradigm of the Messiah? 
Give me your thoughts. And they're kind of going like, uh, well, what do you mean? They go, whose son is the Messiah? And the Pharisees and Sadducees are going, well, he's the son of David. He says, Jesus is quoting Psalm 110. He says, well, verse 43, third question, how does David, by the power of the Holy Spirit, by the revelation of the Holy Spirit, how does David call his son, his great, 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 great grandson, because we know Jesus was born a thousand years after David. How does the David call his great, 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 great grandson the Lord? It's his human offspring. How could he be the Lord? Because all the Pharisees knew Psalm 110, and they're thinking, huh, we never thought about that. How could he call his great, great grandson the Lord? Like, that means he's more than his grandson. He is a man. He's his grandson, but he's more than his grandson. So Jesus says, uh, verse 44, how can, and I'm just going to uh, uh, interpret it to you, how can God the Father say to God the Son, David's Lord, sit at my right hand? That means David's great-great-grandson sitting at the Father's right hand. He's more than David's grandson, but he is fully human, but he's more than human. And so the Pharisees went, oh, we've never really figured that one out. Jesus said, explain that one to me. So he asked him these four questions. And you know, whenever God asks you a question, it's not because God's looking for an answer. <laughs> when God asks, he asked them four. They should have said, note to self, there's something we need to discover from Psalm 110. That's the passage he quotes. That the Messiah, the Christ, is not only a human offspring of David, but he's before David. He's higher than David. He's not just the, the uh, uh, offspring of David. He's the root of David. He's the source that created David. He's the root and the offspring of David that says in Revelation chapter 22. The root, he's the source of David and he follows David. He's before and after David at one and the same time because he's the eternal God, but then he became a man. Of course, these Pharisees are like, no, our idea of the Christ was just somebody who was going to beat up Rome. That's basically what we were thinking the Christ was about. Jesus said, you've missed it. There's so much more you don't understand. Middle page two. <clears throat> the revelation of the Trinity in the New Testament. There are several examples where all three persons of the Godhead are act or speak all in one passage. And the premier example is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, at the baptism. I mean, Jesus is there in his humanity, he's baptized. God the Father speaks out from heaven, my beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit comes on him. So all three of them are acting in his baptism. Paragraph B. The Trinity in the New Testament, the point of it is, it is the Trinity, the point of, of these 70 passages about the Trinity in the New Testament, the point of, that we're emphasizing, they establish the deity of Jesus, not just his great stature as a human prophet, but his deity. But the Trinity reality of the New Testament says more than Jesus' deity. There's plurality. There's God, the Father is deity, the Spirit is deity, and the Son. These truths today, as I've already mentioned, they're both stumbling blocks to many people, but they're also sources of great conflict. And these, yet they're essential because you get rid of the Trinity, you get rid of the deity of Jesus, then Jesus is a liar and a deceiver. You can't have it both ways. As C.S. Lewis said, Lord, lunatic, or liar. So it's essential that even as we want to de uh, get, you know, defend the faith against, uh, and, and, and I don't mean to, uh, uh, you know, uh, people who are resisting and they're uh, very cynical about Christianity. I'm talking about defending the faith. I mean, there's some people called to do that. It's called apologetics. Some are really good at that. I'm talking about defending faith to our young people. You know, the, the, the high school and college students that are confused by the arguments on campus, we need to be able to give them biblical answers. Defend it in that sense. Because it's gonna be resisted more and more, this truth, as we get closer to the Lord's return, but it's more than defending it for the young people. We want to enter into the conversation, the Trinitarian conversation. Paragraph C, Jesus, after he was born of, a virgin, of the Virgin Mary, he became fully God and fully man. He has two natures, 
Most of you are aware of that, but he's fully human and fully God. Ian Thomas uh, was a famous preacher in Britain uh, just in the last uh, uh, generation, and I listened to him in the 70s and 80s. I remember I used to love to hear this man teach from, from the UK. He had a very interesting phrase. He said it many times. He goes, although Jesus was never, ever less than God, he was always fully God, he lived on the earth as though he was never more than a man. Meaning, though he was always God, he never drew on his essential deity. He always lived as a man anointed by the Spirit in prayer and obedience, leaning on the Spirit. He lived like one of us. He could have drawn on the Spirit, because I mean, on his own deity, but he didn't. He said, I'm going to model what it means to, be, to live as a, as a person filled with the Holy Spirit. And so uh, that's what we find in John 13 to 17. It's kind of like an analogy I used to use. Uh, you know, it's not that great of an analogy. It's like, uh, you, you know, our, our, uh, our devices are like the tape recorder, whatever, is that it has batteries or you can plug it into the wall. Jesus had the batteries. He had his own uh, essential deity, but he never drew on the batteries when he lived on the earth. He always lived by the plug and by the Spirit upon him, the Spirit in him. He always drew by the Holy, on the Holy Spirit in the way that we do. He never drew on his own deity during that time. So I have some paragraph D, a number of verses where Jesus' deity is established in the, in the New Testament. <clears throat> Top of page three. Now for the next two pages here on the notes. I mean, they're very, they're very simple. Just develop it ever so briefly. Seven truths about the Trinity that you find in the Scripture. And there's more than seven, but this is a good beginning. So I have them listed there for you, but we'll, the rest of the uh, notes here, I take each one of them and give you a thought or two on each one of them. Let's go down to paragraph B. Again, I'm trying to get our mind to where we're a little more familiar with the basic ideas so we can turn it into conversation and get more living understanding and then get inspired and, and really motivated to go deeper and deeper and deeper. The summary of these seven truths, one God exists forever as three distinct persons. They're equal in nature. All of them are equally God. They enjoy a deep and satisfying relationship with one another, and that's what we're being invited into, that relationship. I have called it over the years the family dynamics within the Godhead. Father, Son, and Spirit, they have this family spirit and these dynamics of how they talk and work together, and they're inviting us into those dynamics. We can call it inviting us into the Trinitarian conversation or the family dynamics of the Godhead. I mean, there's different ways to say it. In other words, the Father, Son, and Spirit, they would speak, think, feel, and act together and said, hey, body of Christ, join in these dynamics with us. They all, all each of them fully possess the divine nature, but, paragraph B at the end, they differ in authority and function. In terms of their work relationship with one another, in terms of their work manifest on the earth, they have different function and different authority, but they are equal in essence as God. Some of you say, okay, I got that. I understood that. And someone says, what? What did you, did you catch what he just said? <laughs> just take a minute, and I don't even mean just right now, but just get familiar with these ideas if this is completely brand new. And it, you will get, they're, they're, they're simple as I'm presenting them. I'm, they're deeper than I present them, and they're deeper than I understand them. But we can get the, the basic introductory understanding. Okay, let's look at uh, truth number one. We're going to look at seven different truths. Again, not that there's only seven, but this is an intro just to kind of get us in the conversation with the Lord. There's only one God. His essential nature is one. Paragraph D, wrote the second truth. He dwells forever as three distinct persons that are co-equal, as divine. I'm saying some of the thing, some of the same things in just, you know, I'm saying it again, but in a slightly different way. How can God, with one undivided being, dwell in three persons? 
Again, that's beyond our understanding. But the scripture says clearly there's one God over and over, and this clearly presents each of them as talking to each other, loving each other, working together, honoring each other, enjoying each other, but being one. In the New Testament, there's one person of the Father, another person of the Son, and yet another distinct person of the Holy Spirit. Each of them has a mind. Each of them possesses divine intellect. Each of them has emotions. They have affections. Each of them are described with gladness, with joy, delight, many different emotions. Each of them have a will. They have a determination in their decision-making and the things that they do. But they're in such unity, it's called one. But they each possess these. I'm just going to break it down a little bit more. Not a lot more, but a couple little points underneath here. They're co-equal in a unity of one substance or one essence. There's no inequality among them in terms of their essence as being fully God, fully powerful, uncreated, eternal. They're not three gods, they're one God, but three persons. Again, that's, that's, the, that's the stumbling block to the uh, human understanding. But go and read that Tozer quote I put you on, on page one, and that kind of helps get you, get, maybe, maybe brings a little bit of like, okay, this is bigger than our ability. The small shell of our mind is not going to empty the vast ocean of God's being like Augustine uh, insinuated. The distinctions. There's distinctions between Father, Son, and Spirit. It's based on their relationship. They each have a unique relationship to the other two. The unique expression of the Father. He relates to the Son and the Spirit as Father. They don't relate to each other as Father, but only He does. The Son relates to the Father as a Son, not the other way around. The, the Father doesn't relate to Him that way. They're different in the way they relate. And the Spirit relates to the Father and the Son in a unique way, different from them. So there's different functions in the way they work and relate, but the same essence. Paragraph 3. Forever, for all eternity, the Father has always functioned as the Father. The Son was always the Son. My point is, God is unchangeable. Jesus didn't start becoming the Son at creation or redemption. He was always the Son, even beforehand. For God so loved the world, He sent His Son. He was the Son before He came. The third truth, each person fully possesses all of God's attributes. They're infinite, each one of them, in their wisdom and power. Infinite measure. And it lasts forever, eternal duration. Like, they don't just have infinite power now, and then, you know, after a couple million years, the batteries run out, and they go, well, it was, boy, that was the day, back in that first billion years. They never, ever diminish their power, wisdom, love, enthusiasm. It never increases and never diminishes. There will never be a time in eternity where God loves you a little bit more than he loves you right now. Like a million years from now, in the perfection of the resurrection, I mean, you're close, face to face. He actually won't love you more then than he does now. And that's part of the takeaway of this. He never changes. He doesn't... He doesn't diminish in his love for you because he put a lot of time and investment in the guy over there. Like he loved that guy a lot and says, well, you know, I'm a little, whew, give me a minute. I'll, you know, I'll be right with you. It's not like that. He never diminishes his love. He never increases it. I love the idea that God loves us. This is like, thank you, Lord, show me more. I love you now as much as I will a billion years from now in the perfection of the resurrection. It's because of who I am and who I've made you to be in Christ to me. Beloved, that's fantastic. I mean, this is fantastic. This isn't like, cool, you know, I think I'll tweet that one. No, turn it into conversation. Well, go ahead and tweet it too. That's no problem with that. But don't, don't limit it to that. Turn it into conversation. I mean, a thousand times a thousand. And the next years to come, say, thank you, Father. Show me more. And then you'll 
kind of accidentally add another phrase here and there to that. Start there. Get in the conversation, and a few more phrases will come here and there. Then your understanding will increase, that illumination. Then your motivation will increase. Your hunger will increase. Top of page four. Each person enjoys. I mean, you could say this so many ways. This is fun to even talk about this stuff. Each enjoys an internal relationship of love with the other. A voluntary. None of them are forced. It's deep in their nature and being. It's mutual. Not one of them out loves or is out more committed than the other. It's completely mutual. They have a deeply satisfying relationship with one another, but that's how they feel about us. Yes, the Lord, he highlights those areas of our life. We're not in uni un unity and agreement with him, and he puts his finger on them, and he doesn't like that area, but it does not the same thing about him changing the way he views us as a person. He can love you in the same way while putting his finger on an area of your life that, that's not pleasing. I mean, human parents do it all the time. You can love your four-year-old, your 10-year-old, but not agree with the issue that they're, that they're stumbling in. But you can be against the issue, but love the child and love the relationship. Well, if we being evil can do that, how much more can our Heavenly Father do it? Imagine how enjoyable fellowship in the Trinity is. I mean, the Father and Son talking and and then joy, and they're inviting us into that, not just in the age to come. We're involved, we're invited into that conversation now, literally right now. If we will talk more, we will feel more, talk more to him about these things. And again, just take the simple truths, read through the Gospel of John, read Genesis to Revelation. Just when you run into a truth about God or a truth about what God does for you, just say, thank you, show me more. Just camp out there for a moment or two. Imagine how enjoyable, number one, the Father loves the Son. The Son loves the Father. I love to say, Father, thank you for the way you love the Son. Show me more. Number two, they deeply delight in using their power and authority and humility to freely honor the other one. The Father loves to honor the Son. But the remarkable thing is, He loves to honor you. Now we know God honors God, but God says, no, this is who I am. This is how I am. I actually feel this way about you. I won't honor this area, but who you are to me is beyond anything you can imagine. They know each other in a deep and personal way. Well, they know us, and they want us to know God the Father wants us to know him in a far greater way. Voluntary. Their enjoyment and their love is free choice. It's in their heart. It's not like, well, that'd be a good deal. You know what? If you love me, I'll love you. No, it's voluntary. It's, it's, uh, it just comes naturally. It flows out of their heart like a self-replenishing river of life. It's self-replenishing love. It never diminishes. It's not a deal. It's not a transaction. It flows out of their heart. And the point, well, that's a great point because of them, but that's how he feels about you. All of this, it's not, I'm not making it all about you and all about me, but we got to get from the outer edges way over here to get in the conversation because when we honor God's investment in our life, he is honored even as we honor the investment he's made in us. Oh, I don't know what I'm living about. The Lord says, don't, don't say that. You're my beloved. You're talking about my beloved. Well, I'm talking about myself. You don't have the right to talk about yourself because that way you're my beloved. You're not just your beloved, you're my beloved. I paid a price for you. I've opened my heart to you. you. I don't want you talking that way. Oh, I thought it was kind of humility. No, if I grovel and I'm terrible, I'm terrible. Yeah, we can be against our failure and our darkness, but not against the essence of who we are before him as part one of his family members. I'm, I'm gonna make all of this practical and personal eventually, I mean, to where it touches us, again, not just that we're filled with joy, that is fantastic, and the Lord loves that in and of itself, but when we're filled with joy, we're walking in what he's filled with joy. It just all merges together. Like one person says, it's all for the glory of God. Well, God's glorified when your heart's full of joy. 
And when your heart's full of joy, his heart's full of joy. I mean, it's all one big, glorious family dynamic together. Paragraph G. Each person different is different in function and authority in their relationship. They differ in that, function and authority, and in their work. There's equality in, God, in the Godhead and all these other ways in their essence of their being, but differences in how they relate to each other and how they function or work in the, in the earth realm, in the, in, the, in the natural realm. Their work involves creation, redemption, and providence. When you read about providence, it means God's leadership over history. Because sometimes you'll read a, you know, a, 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 maybe a, 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 you're researching this and studying it, and it'll say God's providence. And you'll say, what? That, it's talking about his leadership over history. And he works in creation, many facets, not just Genesis 1. It's just as creation continues. You know, as plants and animals are, I mean, creation continues. Life begets life. It's the created order continues. Redemption. More and more people are brought into it. And his leadership over the nations. Kind of real simplistic. The father's role is to direct and to send. He sent the son. He sent the spirit. The son's role is to obey and pray and do the father's work. The spirit's role is to apply the work and to anoint the servants. And again, it all overlaps together, and they all do it together. These differences are not temporary. They last forever. I mean, even in the age to come, they'll function in these distinct ways. When you read the Scripture, the Bible makes it clear. The Father created the heavens and the earth. The Scripture makes it clear. Jesus created the heavens and the earth. It says in Psalm 33, the Spirit did it. Well, who did it? They all did the work together. There's a, sub, a subordination in role, but not in essence of their personhood. Their submission is functional. Again, it's not lesser in deity. Higher authority is not superiority of the essence of their deity. Jesus talked about the Father is greater than I. He said in John 14, verse 28, we'll get to that verse down the road. The Father is greater in his function. The Father isn't more God than I am, but the Father has a higher position of authority in our function and work together. Paragraph H. Each person's work is unified, inseparable, and interdependent on the others. In other words, all three per persons work together in agreement in everything they do. They're all three involved in every work together. They love to work together. They won't work independent of one another. They're all three involved in creation. They all three worked in the incarnation. I mean, God the Father sent Gabriel. God the Spirit rested on Mary in Luke chapter 1, overshadowed her, and God the Son was in her womb. I mean, they're all three involved. They're all three involved in the atonement, all three involved in the resurrection. We'll, we'll look at this later, but the scripture says the Father raised the Son. Another scripture says the Spirit raised the Son. Another scripture, Jesus says, I have authority to lay my life down and I can take it up again myself. What? And it says, well, put all the verses together. The Lord works joyfully in humility with honor and delight with one another. All three persons are involved in every action because they share one mind. They have manifest one divine power. I have written here every operation. The origin is the Father. It proceeds through the Son. It's accomplished by the Holy Spirit. So God never divides himself in his work. So one is working while the other is not working. They're all fully involved in every work together. Again, whether it's in, in creation the incarnation, the Father sent the Son. The Son made himself poor. The Son emptied himself. The Son gave himself. The Son laid his life down. The Holy Spirit overshadowed Mary. So they're all involved, even in the incarnation, in the resurrection, in everything they did. When Jesus fed the 5,000, the Father was working with him. When Jesus walked through crowds that were hostile, trying to kill him, the Father and the Spirit, they were all working together. I mean, what an amazing 
reality. Beloved, this is our home forever. Jesus said in John 14, verse 23, he goes, me and the Father, we want to make our home with you. It's like, really? The way it would be, we want to make our home with you. He goes, no, it's, we're coming after you to invite you into this with us. Beloved, we don't want to be so easily satisfied with just crumbs from his table when there's so much available. And we're in the hour of history when I believe the Holy Spirit's going to unpack these five chapters the greatest teaching by the greatest teacher, the final frontier of the Spirit. I believe we're in the hour of history where this is the, the, the description of the overcoming bride's heart. This is the hour of history to be living in for these passages to be released at a level I believe never seen before in history. Each person mutually dwells in the other. And we'll look at that. We'll spend a session on that. Again, my session... I mean, I feel a little bit awkward. I, you know, I, I'll give this, maybe somebody really new goes, oh, that's really deep. The angel next to me goes, he thought that was deep. <laughs> you know, it's, just, it's the invisible angels and what they're thinking. But anyway, I'll stay focused here. <laughs> I look at this, I go, our deep is not that deep, but we're gonna go for it. How they dwell in each other. They mutually dwell. The father dwells in the son. The son dwells in the father. The Son dwells in the believer, and the believer dwells in the Son. There's four mutual indwellings in the, in the, in the, in the uh, Gospel of John. We'll look at each one of those. The Father and the Son, the Son and the Father, the Son in us, and us in the, in the Son. Four d in mutual indwellings where our mind, emotions, and heart and conversation are brought together in different ways. It's interesting that... Uh, uh, you know, the, the, just, a, just a little hint of this is that Jesus, while on the earth, look at John 18, uh, I mean 1 verse 18, Jesus spoke of himself as in the bosom of the Father when he's living on the earth. He says, he's talk, talking about the, the son, I mean, the Son of God, John's writing this. He said he's in the bosom of the Father. I mean, even when he was ministering on the earth, he was still connected in the Father's heart and in, in, the, in the deepest place of his heart. Jesus would say in John 3, he's talking to Nicodemus. He goes, who is this who came down from heaven? That is the Son of Man. Oh, by the way, Nicodemus, you're looking at me in the flesh. I'm in heaven right now. Nicodemus is going, huh? He goes, yeah, I'm a, he's in heaven right now. I thought you were here. You're the Son of Man. Yeah, I am. But me and the Father have a mutual indwelling. You don't know anything about it. He goes, how can you be the great teacher of Israel you can't understand simple things. How am I going to unpack these mysteries to you, Nicodemus? And then in John 17, Jesus prays it. I'm in the Father. The Father's in me. We're in you. You're in us. And I tell you, we have a glorious journey forever and forever and forever. Amen and amen. I'm going to have the uh, worship team come on up. Let's just stand before the Lord. And again, whenever I say stand before the Lord, that's code for sit if you want to, but do what you want to do. I just want to give you the chance. And so you never really have to. You're not rebellious if you don't. <laughs> Father, here we are before you. Lord, we love you. Lord, we want to go on this journey this year and next year and the decade after. We want to go somewhere so the five-year-olds now, when they're 15 and 20 years old, we have so much more to give them. And at an hour of history when so much more darkness is exploding on the earth, but the glory of God is released at a whole other level. Help us now, Lord. Now be patient with yourself. Again, this is like, well, that was really deep. That was cool. Like, I don't think I understood what you said. Just go slow with yourself, okay? Take time. You'll get it. You'll get some of this if you're brand new with it. Here we are, Holy Spirit. We ask you to touch us. I am yours. I am yours. Thank you, God. Yes, I am. I am yours. Thank you. Show me I am yours, yes I am wholly yours, here we are Lord, I am yours, yes I am 
that you want me to be yours. Thank you that you won't let me go away from you. Thank you. I am yours. Yes, I am. Holy Spirit, come and rest on us. Revelation. 
foundation of your love. We want to know the Spirit. We want to know the Father. We want to know the Son. The way you love us. I want to be in the bosom of the Father with you. Increase, increase. Show us how we are three and one at the same time.
the fire in your eyes. The disciples said, did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke? Let it burn in my life. Speak to us, let our hearts burn like the apostles. Hold the fire in your eyes. Let it burn on the inside. Hold the fire.
Oh, see. 